Hello, my name is James Broom, and I'm the Director of Engineering at a UK-based technology consultancy called Engine. And today I'm going to talk about ensuring quality and avoiding inaccuracies in your data insights. Now, the majority of this talk is going to be a hands-on technical walkthrough. I'm going to show you some proven patterns and practices and techniques for adding testing to your data solutions. I'm going to demonstrate how you can add automated quality gates in areas that you might not have even considered before. And specifically, we're going to look at testing Power BI reports and Azure Analysis Services models, long-running ETL processes, such as Azure Data Factory and Synapse Pipelines, and interactive notebooks, such as Databricks, Jupyter Notebooks, and Azure Synapse Notebooks. But before we do any of that, I want to start with a story, because I want to illustrate why any of this is important. So let's cast our minds back to the autumn of 2020. Now, in relative terms, this was still early days in terms of the COVID pandemic. In the UK, at least, we were still, still very much in the middle of uh, waves of rising cases. We had daily briefings by the UK government on TV. And we had a test and trace scheme in place where the idea was to identify positive cases quickly and then follow up with close contacts to stop the spread as quickly as possible. In October, we were reporting between seven and 8,000 cases a day. But in early October, Public Health England reported that during the course of one week, they'd been quite significantly underreporting cases. They'd reported around 50,000 cases, and it turns out there were a further 15,000 that had gone unreported due to an IT error. So about a quarter of cases were going unreported for a week. It took them eight days to realise this mistake and then correct the figures. And during that time, there was around 2,000 cases being unreported every day that were being missed. So clearly this was a big impact. Thousands of people were totally unaware they'd been potentially exposed and potentially and unknowingly spreading the virus even further. So something had gone wrong somewhere. And what had gone wrong was this. Due to the immense time pressure to get this process up and running, the testing results were being provided in CSV format from the various uh, testing bodies and then collated in Excel in order to report the aggregated results. And for some unexplained reason, the legacy file format of .xls was being used rather than .xlsx. And this meant that the Excel worksheets had a limit of 65,000 rows of data. So the aggregated results from the CSV datasets were being truncated at this limit. What was interesting was how this was being reported in the UK media. It was essentially being described as a technical issue. And even more than that, Excel was being blamed for the error. But there was no bug in Excel. It wasn't Excel's fault. The 65,000 row limit had been present, uh, present in XLS file formats since the 1980s, and it was well documented uh, if you went and looked at it on the Microsoft documentation. What actually went wrong was that nobody had tested this process. Nobody had validated that the actual outputs matched what was expected given the known set of inputs. So it wasn't a technical issue. It was a people and process issue. Nobody had stopped to, check, stopped to check if the numbers looked right. And by the time they did, the impact had already happened. Now, I'm guessing most people listening weren't or aren't responsible for collating figures for a global pandemic, but some of you might have been. And if you're not, there's every chance you're working with other data sources that easily could have an impact on, uh, on human health. For example, algorithms for self-driving cars, results of clinical drug trials. And if not potentially dangerous in a life-threatening way, I'm guessing at least some of you do work with data that has an impact on a personal level, such as mortgages or loans or credit card scoring. Maybe in a criminal justice system or approval of visas or residency applications. Or a billing process for utilities or subscription services. And if not on a personal level, then definitely at a commercial level. In the organisations you're working for, sales forecasts, weekly reporting KPIs, or customer satisfaction metrics. So fundamentally, the question I want to ask yourselves for any data solution, for any data insight that you're working on, developing, or responsible providing to your stakeholders, your organisations, or your customers is this. Does it matter if it's wrong? Because there's really only two answers to this question. And if the answer is no, then why are you, as a data professional, even involved? And if the answer is yes, then you need to be able to prove that it's right. And that sounds obvious. Right? I could have had a, a show of hands if we were here in person. How many of you actually have comprehensive testing in your data solutions 
I guarantee there wouldn't be that many hands up. And I'm prepared to stand by that statement because I've been a consultant for over 20 years and I've had the privilege of working with many great teams in many successful organisations across many industries, even across three continents. And yet that statement's still true. So why don't we do it? Uh, at the risk of kind of massively oversimplifying things, I think there's three main excuses that I've heard over the years that come up time and time again. The first one is we don't have the time. A case in point, this is the Public Health England example I just talked about. They were under a lot of pr pressure to get this process up and running from nothing. So corners were clearly cut in order to get a process from, from the scratch very, very quickly. But the argument they didn't have time to make proper testing into the process falls down a bit when you consider how much time was then spent cleaning up the mess and dealing with the impact of getting it wrong in the first place. Now, there's tons of research out there about how um, much quicker it is to solve problems during development than it is before they make it into production, in the software industry at least. Think about product recalls in the car industry. How much time and money is spent on testing their processes to try and avoid that solution, or that situation, sorry. You say you don't have time to test something, I would argue that probably you don't have time to test to get it wrong. Now the second uh, reason for this is we don't know what the numbers should be. And this is another very common situation, especially when dealing with large amounts of data. And by large, I really mean um, bigger than can fit on a single screen in an Excel worksheet, for example. Beyond that, it's hard for humans to hold that amount of data in their heads, which then makes it harder for someone else to tell you what the right answer should be. And that's assuming that people agree even on how you calculate the answer in the first place. I worked with one organisation who had nearly 20 different definitions of gross margin. And that was just one of about 40 KPIs that were being reported on in a standard set of management dashboards. But if you don't know what you should be doing, then the answer is simple. You need to stop. You need to go back and do the hard work of defining your requirements properly. Forget about the data and technology for a second and start with what the expected outputs are supposed to be. And I was actually here talking at DPS uh, conference last year on exactly that subject. The third reason is this. It's hard. How on earth do you even test a Power BI report, for example? And to this I say, yes, software development is hard, and to be blunt, that's why you're being paid to do it. I deliberately use the term software development because that's what all of this is. Data engineering, data science, data wrangling, data modeling. They're just different terms for software development. If you're adding a formula to an Excel worksheet, you're developing software. If you're writing DAX queries to create measures for a Power BI report, you're developing software. If you're creating Python scripts to generate statistics, you're developing software. If you're designing ETL processes to populate a data warehouse, you're developing software. And that's exactly what I am. I've been a software developer for over 20 years, and yet I've done and do all of the things I've just talked about. I might have been designing and delivering big and complex data projects and data platforms, data solutions for the last decade or so of that, but I'm still doing that as a software developer. And that means I'm always looking for a way to test something. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to help you do the same. I'm going to walk through three practical examples uh, that cover a large portion of the types of technologies and processes in the data platform projects that I've been involved in recently. And I'm going to show you some approaches that you can take away and apply to your data solutions. So not only do your numbers look right, but you can prove it. So in the first demo, I'm going to walk through an approach that we've taken to test Power BI reports as well as analysis of these databases by validating the calculations and the data in the underlying tabular models. I'm going to use Power BI throughout the demo, but everything I'm going to show is equally applicable to analysis services. Now, as a reminder, there's no official support or recommended approach from Microsoft about any of this. So the approach is based on engines, experience and recommendation. There's no available testing frameworks for Power BI reports. We have no control over how the reports are being rendered in the user interface. And at first glance, the report business logic is encapsulated within the underlying Power BI service. However, Power BI is built on top of analysis services. And the general direction of the team and the product over recent years is that Power BI is eventually becoming a superset of Azure analysis services. And whilst an analysis service model is an in-memory compressed BI data cube, it's essentially just a database. And admittedly, it's not a relational database, but a database nonetheless. So if we can connect to the tabular model using client SDKs or APIs, then we can execute queries over it to test what's inside. And everything I'm going to demo is based on that approach. 
But before we go any further, there's a couple of big caveats to point out. So number one, we are testing the tabular model only and not the visualization layer of Power BI. So by validating that the measures and the calculated columns and the data modeling are working as we expect, we're effectively testing uh, the business logic in our data application, but not the presentation layer. And number two is we don't have control over the DAX queries that are actually getting executed by the Power BI visualizations themselves when the report is loaded. So any tests that we do execute are merely simulations or, or replicas, if you like, of what the report is actually doing. However, uh, it is possible to intercept the DAX that the report is generating. Um, so those queries can be used in the tests themselves if you need to. So the simulation is as close as possible to the real thing. However, even with those caveats, we found there's a huge value in writing and running tests over the type of your model to test the business logic um, that's been added into the data model. Whilst the, that, whilst the visualizations themselves are also important, the right visualization, the right position, showing the right data points, having the confidence that the calculations behind the data points is what really adds confidence to a data solution. For the most part, it's a reasonable assumption to make that the visualization layer is going to be working as you expect, generating the max stacks queries, so we can focus on testing that the schema and the data in the model are correct. So let's open Power BI. And I'm going to use a sample report that I've just taken from the Microsoft website. And whilst that's loading up, I'm going to remind you that behind every Power BI report is a type of the model. And that, in effect, is an analysis services database. When opening a Power BI report in Power BI Desktop, what's actually happening behind the scenes is a local instance of analysis services is actually being started automatically. And you can find that out by using a tool called DAX Studio, which is an external tool that's freely available to download from the internet. And once the Power BI report has opened, if you have DAX Studio installed, you will see it under the external tools menu under here, and can open it very simply like this. And DAX Studio will detect that we have a Power BI report open. If I click the connect button, you can see it has the name of the Power BI PBX file already pre-populated in the connect wizard. And I click connect, we're going to connect to the model in that report. But the interesting thing is down the bottom right hand side here, you can see it says localhost port 53562. And that is the server information of the analysis services instance that is currently running to power Power BI Desktop with the report we're opening. And that's the key bit, because if we can get that, we can create a connection string using the .NET SDKs and open a connection to the analysis of this database. And that means using third-party tooling like DAX Studio, but more significantly in this case, our own code, we can create a connection to the tabular model, and then we can start to write some tests against it. Now. Once we've uh, developed a model and developed a report and we want to publish it up to the Power BI workspace, what's even better is that we can do the same thing in the Power BI service. Um, and a couple of years ago, Microsoft exposed um, a, an, an endpoint, if you like, in the Power BI service called the XMLA endpoint. And we can use the same tools, the same .NET SDKs, to connect to a Power BI report in the Power BI service by changing the connection string to point to the XMLA endpoint. And that can be found in the workspace settings panel for any premium enabled workspace. So there's a restriction around this. The workspace needs to have a capacity assigned to it, either Power BI Premium or Power BI Embedded, or nowadays through a premium per user workspace. But if you have the XML endpoint enabled, it means we can use the same code that writes our tests with the same connection process, just changing the connection string, either to point to our local analysis of this database or the XML endpoint available in the Power BI service to make the connection. And although I just mentioned .NET SDKs, and I'm going to start by going down that route, a bit later on, I'm also going to show you a different way that you can query the tabular model without the need for any SDK, just by using REST APIs, meaning you can do this in any programming language or technology. So for the first demo, we're going to use C-sharp and .NET. This is just one way to achieve this result. And as you'll see, C-sharp isn't a prerequisite, and as we go through the rest of this talk, I've deliberately picked a different technology and tool set for each walkthrough to show you that the approaches I'm demonstrating aren't tied to a specific programming language or testing framework. 
So first of all, I'm going to switch to Visual Studio to show you how we can write some tests against our Power BI desktop file that is running locally. I am going to use a framework called Specflow, which is a .NET based BDD framework that allows us to write tests as executable specifications in a human readable language in the Gherkin syntax, which is an industry standard, uh, very widely used um, structure, if you like, for structuring BDD specifications. And the whole thing about BDD, which stands for behavior driven development, is to describe the behavior of your system in a very easy human readable plain English or, or other language of your choice uh, format. So uh, to aid easy collaboration between the technical users who are developing the system, in this case, the report and the business users. So in this case, maybe the business analyst or the, the end users ultimately who understand the domain of the data. And because we're testing Power BI reports in this case, our language talks about the things that we would find in our data model. So measures, uh, results, filters, and that kind of thing. So you can see I've described here quite a simple set of scenarios about the data model behind our sample report. If we go back to Power BI, this is the retail analysis sample that contains sales by stores over geographic areas. So we've adopted uh, an approach where we have a feature for each report. So this is our example report feature. And our first scenario is around total sales. The total sales measure is probably one thing we want to add into this data model. Imagine we hadn't created our report yet and we started to do some data modeling. When we query the total sales measure, then we expect the result to be this particular value, in this case, rounded to two decimal places. This is absolutely something we could discuss with the business. We could talk about how do you calculate total sales? Um, what's the expression that needs to go behind that measure in order to validate that particular KPI? We've made an assumption that the report is kind of loaded with a known set of data. In our experience, that's a fairly good uh, uh, a way to work in this kind of model. Um, clearly, we could write some code that would automatically load data into the data model, reprocess the data set, refresh everything and, and do that every time. We found that to be quite a heavyweight process and actually what's a much better thing to do is to work from a known uh, static set of test data that's, that's much more cut down, simplified and smaller than what you might have in production that allows you to easily kind of uh, verify calculations and measures you know, outside of Power BI as well as inside of Power BI and work collaboratively between you know, someone who understands the data and the person who's kind of developing the report in parallel. So we've assumed there's a, there's a set of data in the report that we know about. And once we understand how our total sales measure is calculated based on that set of data, the results should be this particular value, which is about 45 uh, million uh, uh, pounds, I guess, or dollars, whatever, whatever the currency is in, in this case. So that's a very simple kind of test that we've got, total sales across the whole data set. The next logical thing to do, given this is an interactive report, is we might want to filter that down by something. You know, Power BI is, is, is designed to, to slice and dice the data. So how would we do that? Well, we'd apply a filter. So we've seen in our report that our data model is a, is a, is a retail based one and we've got some stores. So what would happen if we wanted to filter the stores down to say we can see a store here called lenses? What if we just want to look for the data for lenses? So let's expand our scenario language a bit further. And in this case, let's say given we have the following filter applied. So we're now talking about setting up this line in a different way. And we've defined now through that process that we've got a table called store, a dimension table that has a property called chain. And in this our, in our known data set, we have a, a store chain called lenses. So given that we have filtered stores down to lenses, now when we query the total sales measure, what happens? We would expect the value to be different because now we're just calculating total sales for lenses. So we can prove all this if we go back to the report. And I've actually added an extra page into the sample that shows total sales We've got a little uh, table up here that allows us to do lenses. And we can see that when we apply the lenses filter, it goes down to about 13 million. But clearly Power BI is showing a much kind of uh, simplified, kind of aggregated uh, and truncated view of that actual value. If you want to see what that was like for real, we could use something like DAX Studio to execute a query for real. What I'm going to do first though, is run the test to see what happens. Now behind the scenes, Specflow allows us to generate, in this case, C Sharp code to actually run code um, to execute these statements that we're making. If we open up our C-sharp file, we can see we have methods behind each of those uh, definitions, we call them, in our feature file, that actually do something. So when we say, when we're going to add a named measure to our query, 
we have some code that does that. And what we're doing behind the scenes is just building up a DAX expression dynamically. So when we add a measure in, we add the name of the measure in the syntax that you would if you were executing the same query in DAX Studio. When we want to add a filter, we do the same thing. We start to add uh, extra syntax to our, to our DAX query expression, in this case, the filter table name and the filter statement. And by the time we say that we want to run the query, what we've got is a dynamic expression that's built up that evaluates into something that looks a little bit like this. It's a simple evaluate statement with a simple summarize column statement. And in the body of that expression, we have the columns we want to pull back, the filters we want to apply, and the measures we want to pull back. So let's start by running the test to prove it passes. I will need to update my connection string to point to my local Power BI desktop environment. So I go back to DAX Studio. We can see I'm winning on port 5356 and I have a config file in here somewhere that I can update. 53.56.2. And now if I can open up the Test Explorer window, it will automatically find all the tests in the solution. And let's run the total sales test. And this should run relatively quickly. And in theory, it should pass. And it does. Now, if we were to debug that test, let's uh, break on execute query. We will be able to see the actual code, the query story code that actually gets executed uh, in DAX. So we run the test again. This time, let's debug. And the code will break point here. And if we see the query, we can see the DAX expression that's actually being generated. So we're going to DAX Studio. We can actually paste that directly in. It looks a little about this. Evaluate, summarize columns, total sales, total sales. And we run it. And we can actually see the actual value that's being returned from the data model, which we can see over on the left-hand side here, which is 45 million and a lot of decimal places. If we do the same thing again with the filter applied, we'd see a much more complicated statement because it would have filter expressions in it as well. Now, so far we're using Visual Studio, we're using .NET, and we're using what you can see here on the screen, the ADOMD.NET SDK. So this solution here, this testing kind of framework I've designed, is limited to running in .NET. It requires the analysis services SDKs that are only available in .NET. But we have another option. Because whilst Power BI is a Microsoft-based tool, it's clearly used widely enough to be prevalent in environments where .NET and C Sharp isn't used at all, either due to team skill set or wider technology choices, for example. Um, and because of that, we need a different way of doing this. And um, sort of the end of last year, Microsoft um, enabled a new capability in the Power BI REST API called the Execute Queries. API endpoint. And if we look at that, here's the documentation. So for any data set that's been published into Power BI service, we have an execute queries API that allows us to execute a DAX expression. And if you look, we have a JSON payload, and in the body of that payload is just a DAX statement, just like we were running locally over our Power BI desktop file. And what comes back is a JSON payload representing a tabular set of data. So it's very easy to replicate what I was doing in .NET and C Sharp and Specflow in another testing framework in another language that doesn't require .NET, that doesn't require the ADOMD .NET SDKs, and actually, instead of executing the queries that way, executes the queries over HTTP using the REST API and the execute queries endpoint. Now, the execute queries API has some pros and cons compared to using the .NET SDKs, and this can impact what you can and can't do from a testing perspective. So the REST API only works over the Power BI service. Uh, a report has to have been published into a Power BI workspace for this to work. Clearly, you can't run the REST API over a local Power BI desktop file. That will implicate, uh, or that will impact, sorry, your kind of local developer workflow in terms of at what point you can actually start testing things. You need to push things up into the service before you, before you can do that. However, 
the Execute Queries API is available to all workspaces. So there's no restriction that means you need a premium capacity like we did for the XMLA endpoint. And that means there's no cost implications going down this route. So the .NET based approach as a reminder requires either premium capacity, uh, Power BI embedded or premium per workspace. The REST API is available for free inside any Power BI workspace. And finally, once the .NET SDK approach clearly requires C Sharp or .NET in order to connect to the Tabular model, whether it's running locally in Power BI Desktop or whether it's via the XMLA endpoint, using this Execute Queries REST API means we can make that connection using any programming language. So for example, we could do exactly the same thing in Python or JavaScript or any other kind of testing framework and programming language of your choice. So to summarize this demo, Behind Power BI and analysis services is a tabular model. And that be, can be connected to like any other database technology. And this means that your schema, your data transformations, your measures, your calculated columns can all be tested to give confidence to reports and Power BI models. There's different ways to connect to the tabular model using .NET SDKs and using the REST API. And depending on which you choose, this means you can connect and run tests over a local PBIX file or a report published into the Power BI service. I've shown you how to do this in C Sharp and talked about how to do it in JavaScript using well-known testing frameworks in each domain. And hopefully you can see how you could equally do this in Python or any other language technology of your choice. So whilst testing Power BI reports isn't something that many people think about, it's absolutely possible. And if it matters if your reports are wrong, then it's absolutely something you should be doing. In the second demo, I'm going to walk through an approach we've taken to test long running cloud ETL processes, specifically using Azure Synapse pipelines, but equally applicable to Azure Data Factory and conceptually applicable to any other cloud data processing platform or technology. And there's a couple of very common challenges when testing cloud ETL processes. Uh, one, they might take a long time to run, by which I mean they're not instant. And two, they might process and output lots of data making the results very hard to validate. Now there are solutions and patterns to both of these challenges, which can be applied to make testing these long running processes uh, possible. The first one is pretty straightforward, and that's just to apply asynchronous polling patterns, allowing the test to kick off a pipeline and then periodically polling for completion. The fact it takes a long time might mean this type of test isn't something you want to run on every single source code change, but rather something that gets run on every release or even every night, for example. Second challenge can be overcome with a simple mindset shift in how you test the outputs. And we're typically used to testing or validating specific outputs or values. And that becomes hard when you're processing large amounts of data. And actually I say large, even 10 rows of data with 10 fields would mean testing 100 different specific values. So there's two different methods we can use here and both are equally useful in different ways. First one is called data snapshot testing. So it may be that we absolutely have to test every specific value in our data set. And in that case, a technique called snapshot testing is very useful. And rather than test every value individually, we can test that the entire output matches what we expect based on a previous known state. So for example, we run our pipeline for a known set of inputs or parameters. It produces an output that we manually validate to confirm that things are working as expected. And then we then snapshot that output and store it with our tests. So we can repeat this test run under the same set of conditions and always expect the same output every time. And this protects us from further changes down the line, introducing bugs or regression issues in scenarios that we've already tested. So the downside is clearly we need to perform the initial validation ourselves, but it provides a repeatable safety net as the platform or the solution evolves over time. Now the second method is behavior-based testing, because it may also be of course that we can't test every specific value we may be relying on external systems or dynamic data sources that are temporal or you know, subject to kind of configuration changes or outside of our control. But we do care about our, how our system handles certain situations, for example, dealing with data quality issues. So rather than testing the data points themselves, we could validate that, for example, duplicate records are removed by relying on an expected row count. So this makes the test less brittle to the specific data but validates the system is behaving as expected for the expected scenarios. Let's have a look at how this works in practice. Okay, 
So I've opened Synapse Studio. And inside Synapse, we have a Synapse pipeline that looks a little bit like this. It's quite simple for this example. It basically has one activity called copy data, and it's copying data from a source to a sync, and in that process, converting it to a Parquet file. So the input data set is basically a CSV file, and the output data set is basically a Parquet file. So it's just a conversion of, of, of data source type. Now, if we look at the pipeline level, we can see we've got a bunch of parameters expected for the pipeline in terms of the input container, the input directory, the input file, and then where the outputs are going to be. So the whole process is look for a specific file as an input, copy the data, converting it to Parquet, and then dump it in the output directory. So we want to test this pipeline. Now, this time, we're not going to use Visual Studio. Instead, we're going to use VS Code. And we're not going to use .NET. This time, we're going to use JavaScript. But what you can see on the screen here is very similar to what we saw in the last demo. This is a feature file again. We're using a BDD framework, just like in .NET and SpecFlow, although this time in JavaScript, we're using Cucumber.js. And I mentioned that the Gherkin language was ubiquitous and kind of a standard uh, syntax across BDD frameworks, and this is, this is proof of that. So Cucumber is a very, very uh, well-used and highly used kind of BDD framework across many different languages, and this is the JavaScript implementation. And the last time we were testing Power BI reports, so that the, the language of the spec was around measures, it was around filters, it was around data tables. And in this case, we're testing a pipeline. So the language is slightly different. And you can see here, we have a feature around a pipeline that we're saying in order to build our reports based on the output of the pipeline, we need to automatically process the data from the data source. So in this case, we have a background, which is our kind of setup step, saying that we expect there to be a pipeline called demo pipeline. Behind the scenes, as you see in our code in a second, this is basically configuring a, a, a configuration, configuration value for what our pipeline is going to be called when we make a connection into Synapse. And we have one scenario, our golden path or our, our happy path scenario that the pipeline runs successfully. Our setup action is that the data process is going to be in this CSV file called sample sales data. Our act action, if you like, is going to be triggering the pipeline. And then our assertion is that the pipeline is run successfully, so we get a successful response and the output data matches the expected result. So before we do anything, let's have a look how, uh, how this all works in practice. So given the data to be processed is sample sales data.csv. So in this test solution, we have a data folder with a demo pipeline folder for our demo pipeline, and we have a CSV file called sample sales data. And you can see it looks like this. So this is just some sample data I've taken from the internet, an open source database, uh, data source, sorry with some sales domain data around uh, purchases in different kind of locations across the US. So I mentioned earlier that what's difficult about testing ETL processes is that often the input data and the output data are quite large. And what we're doing here is we are um, in effect defining our scenarios in the data input files themselves. So in this case, our sample sales data CSV file, that is the scenario. We're not manually keying in every different value that's going to go in. We're basically saying pointing it at this file. So we want to name this file in a way that represents our kind of scenario. So in this case, it's just a happy path. So just sample sales data is going to get processed successfully. Now we talked about snapshot testing. And the key thing here is that the very first time we run the test, we don't know what the output's going to be. There's going to be a manual step to begin with to validate that the pipeline is working as, uh, as we expect. And once we've run it once and we've validated that output, that output gets kind of locked in, if you like, to the test framework. So it actually gets committed to source control in this case. It's part of the, the, the code that we've got in this demo. And then every time we run it again since, it will auto automatically uh, check the same results. In it. And if nothing's changed, then the test will pass. So before we do anything else, let's run this test and see what happens. So down here, this is a Node.js solution in JavaScript. So I'm going to run npm test. And it's going to execute this one scenario. Now, once this kicks off, we'll see the test running. And I can talk to you what's going on. So the very first step behind this feature is that we are keying up the sample file that we want to run the test on. And behind the scenes, what the test is doing is actually uploading this CSV file into our data lake account that's backed by our uh, Synapse workspace. So we go over to Synapse Studio. We can see in our data lake, in our test data container, at the minute there's nothing in there, but as the test starts to run, we will start to see that CSV file being uploaded into the, into the container.
and I refresh the container now, you can see we have a folder called Demo Pipeline because we're testing our demo pipeline. And if I double click on that, we can see inside here, we have our sample sales data CSV that's been uploaded and that's what the pipeline is gonna reference. Now, we talked about long running processes. The actual pipeline itself isn't gonna be instant, it's gonna kick off and it's gonna trigger and run. So if we go back over here and we're going to monitor, we should see that our pipeline has started running. In fact, it's already finished, it took 13 seconds. But it could take a long time. This pipeline could be very complicated, it could be pulling in lots of data, it could be using spark pools that take a few minutes to spin up, for example. But we can see here that we triggered the pipeline and the pipeline has run successfully. Behind the scenes, what's going on is our test framework is actually polling for results. So if we look in our pipeline helper, using the Azure SDKs for JavaScript, in this case, the artifacts client from the Synapse Artifacts NPM package, we can trigger a new pipeline run, and then we can just use a loop and poll whilst that pipeline's running and check for the response until it's finished. So this test could run for a few minutes, this test could run for a few hours, depending on your scenario and how often and how regularly you want to actually trigger the, trigger the, uh, the tests. So our pipeline has run successfully, and that means actually our test has also passed. And what you can see in that process is we've now got a file in our snapshots output folder. And what's happened is we are using um, a framework, in this case called Chai Snapshot Testing. So because we're using the Chai Assertion Framework for Cucumber.js, this is an extension that specifically deals with snapshots. Now I go into my step definitions file. You can see that when we say that the output data matches its expected result, we're using this snapshot extension here based on our input file name and the Chai um, uh, snapshot extension will look specifically based on a kind of convention for the snapshots folder and it will look for a file with the same name as the input file. And what you can see here is actually serialized the data set that we've got back from our response. So once the pipeline's run, we've queried the data lake. We can see in our output folder, if we go back to uh, develop, We will have our results. And remember our results are being converted into Parquet files because that's all our, our, our pipeline, our copy activity is doing. So we have a demo pipeline output folder and we'll have a Parquet file with a GUID that's basically been automatically generated for the test run. So the test framework is then querying that data back out. And when we call the snapshot extension method, it's basically serializing that data frame or that data set if you like to disk. And that's our initial snapshot. Now at this point, it's on us to prove that that's correct. So there would be a process with the QA team, with a business stakeholder validating that based on our input data that we passed in, is this, the, is this the data that we expect coming out the other side? And every time we run this test, we run it again, our test is always gonna pass because nothing's changed. But if something was to change in the future, we now have a, a safety net, if you like, that the uh, output is always gonna be checked against what we've committed into our version control repository as the expected output. So this test first will pass because nothing's changed. Okay, but if we were to change something, and in this case, we could just change the input file, we now know that the output is not gonna match what we expect. So let's change this value. and run the test again. And this day, in this case, we'll see a test failure. Now in reality, it's probably not gonna be the input file that's gonna change. What's more likely to change is the pipeline processing itself. As new features are added, as new business logic is added, and as the pipeline kind of evolves over time, the point here is we are proving that we're not introducing anything that's already been validated and QA tested. And as you can see, our test framework has now reported that one of the tests was failing. And if we dig into the details here, you can see that actually it's calling out the expected value versus the actual value. So we can dig into the details. Now this is all well and good when we have control over the input data set, where it's a static uh, kind of set of values. Whilst we're not actually handwriting out every single value in this data set that we want to test and validate, we are actually testing them all. It's just we're relying on the snapshot um, process to, to test the whole data set as one thing rather than each individual value individually. But clearly there's cases where we can't do that. 
And we talked about um, this kind of behavior based testing method that I'm going to show you now. So if we go back to our feature, we might want to, for example, care more about how our pipeline deals with a certain scenario. For example, duplicate rows are, are being deleted. Um, so we can care less about the specifics of the data that's coming in and out, but actually the behavior of how it handles a certain scenario. So we've added a new scenario that duplicates are going to be excluded. In this case, the data to be processed is a new CSV file called all duplicate rows. We've named the scenario in the data file itself. And if we look at all duplicate rows.csv, it's a much smaller uh, file, but you can see every row is the same. That's the whole point. All, of all, all rows are duplicates. What we'd expect in this scenario is if we want all our duplicates to be excluded, when the pipeline is triggered and the pipeline runs successfully, then actually our output data should only contain one row because all the duplicates are, duplicates are excluded and we only end up with one in the output. Now, in fact, I haven't implemented this feature in our test pipeline, so if we ran this test, it would fail. But what's interesting is we now have a test-first approach to defining our functionality that we care about in our pipeline. So the next step will be go back into the pipeline and change our copy activity behavior such that it can deal with duplicate rows, and actually we get the output results that we expect. So in summary, in this demo, I've proved that long-running data processing in cloud ETL tools like Data Factory or Synapse Pipelines can absolutely be tested by adopting asynchronous polling patterns to wait for processing to complete. If datasets are large enough to make testing every individual value problematic, then snapshot testing is a good and simple solution to add regression test type coverage to these types of tests. If you can't test specific output values, you can still add quality assurance through testing behaviors in a more general sense, like number of rows or files or error conditions. And whilst the demo I've just shown you uses JavaScript and Node.js, there's nothing in there that couldn't be achieved using another technology or testing framework or language because the various client SDKs I've been using, um, specifically the Azure ones, are just interacting with REST APIs under the covers. So in the third and final demo, I'm going to walk through an approach that we've used to test Azure Synapse Notebooks. As you probably come to expect by now though, the approach is equally applicable to Jupyter Notebooks or Databricks. And notebooks are really interesting. We think they've been a bit of a game changer in recent years in the data and analytics space, as they allow for quick, ad hoc, collaborative and experimental working patterns to be applied to data problems, which means they can be used to great effect in data science and data modeling. But they're also really useful in standard ETL processes. They act as living, breathing documentation of a process, allowing you to mix in markdown and executable code side by side, meaning that data processing isn't locked away in a store procedure or an SSIS package, but in a human readable format that allows for collaboration and understanding across a team. But that agility comes with a trade-off. Because very quickly, we've seen that notebooks start from the backbone of systems and processes that businesses start to depend on. And if business insights are being surfaced, then there's a need for quality assurance, because without it, inaccuracies in the data are going to end up going unnoticed. So let's open Azure Synapse and work through an example. So in our first demo, we're using Visual Studio and c .net and Specflow to add tests to Power BI reports. In the second demo, we're using VS Code and JavaScript and Cucumber.js to add tests to our Synapse pipeline. In this third and final demo, because we are testing notebooks, are we going to use Synapse Studio as our IDE? And the code and the test we're going to write are going to be in Python, or specifically PySpark, which is the SDK and API to interact with the Spark runtime uh, in Synapse. So let's imagine we have a fairly simple use case. Uh, we work for some kind of sales organization that has um, some data around sales orders. And if we look, we've got a, a simple kind of uh, set of data here in a CSV file that has some orders by city and region within the US. And we're tasked with producing some um, aggregated kind of sales metrics and reports. And we thought, okay, a good way to start would be to use notebooks so we can explore the data and start to work on our kind of ETL logic. So we might start something like this. We might want to read the CSV data in into a Spark data frame from the data lake. Then we might think, okay, there's some, probably some simple data prep we need to do. For example, let's drop duplicates based on duplicate order IDs in the, in the data that we've noticed. And then we might, might want to start thinking about, well, what kind of metrics we're calculating. We want to group the data by region and start to sum up the total price. We can start to do kind of total sales by region. 
Once we've got that, we then want to save the output back into our uh, data lake so we can start to build some reports or visualizations or dashboards or alerts based on the kind of the, the, the sales metrics that we're calculating. So let's run this notebook to see what happens. And once a Spark session has started up, the notebook runs fairly quickly because it's fairly simple and the data set isn't particularly large. And as you can see, the output here is our aggregated total sales by region. Now, I've mentioned a few times that one of the great advantages of notebooks is the ability to go from ad hoc and experimental data processing into something repeatable and automated. And in Synapse, it can be as simple as, as saying adds to pipeline. If we do this, our notebook is added to a new Synapse pipeline and we can start to add a trigger to run this notebook on a nightly schedule. We can start to parameterize it so that it looks in you know, the right folder in the data lake, for example, to take the latest sales figures each night. And suddenly we've gone from something that was a proof of concept into you know, a line of business application that's now automated and gonna generate those results every night. However, that agility comes with a downside. And that is, you know, in the spirit of um, exploring and you know, ad hoc kind of data prep, in some ways, we've lost you know, the rigor and best practice around solid engineering practices. In this case, proving what we're doing is correct by adding tests. So let's go back to our notebook and have a look at what we might want to test in the first place. So even though this is a fairly simple use case, there's still some logic in here. We're dropping, dropping duplicate orders in one of our cells. Now, that's a one-line piece of code, but it could be implemented different ways. Our, our logic is based on dropping, dropping duplicates based on the duplicate order ID. But equally, it could be implemented based on you know, every cell in it, every row being the same. So how you even define a duplicate row is open to ambiguity. Now, if we wanted to add tests to actually lock in this logic and prove that the behavior is exactly as we expect, we need to do some restructuring of the notebook. And this is the key thing that everything that we're gonna talk about is based around. What's great is that notebooks have cells. They already have the ability to separate out logical steps in a process and we're going to expand on that by turning each logical step into a defined function. So in this next notebook, we have exactly the same process. But what we've done is wrapped each piece of code in a cell in a function, and we've named the function with the intention of what it's going to do. So we load the data. We remove duplicate orders. We calculate the cells by region, and we save the output back to the data lake. Now what's interesting, if we were to run this notebook end to end, nothing would happen because all we've done is define the functions themselves. We're not actually calling them. So in this notebook, we have one additional cell, which if you like, is the, the orchestration cell or the workflow cell, actually specifically calls into each of those functions in the order we want them to run, which runs everything in the notebook end to end. And we get exactly the same output as before. Now that we've restructured our notebook so that every kind of separate piece of logical processing is defined in a separate function, we can start to add some tests. So in this next version of the notebook, we've done exactly that. Now, because we're writing Python code, we can actually just import the fairly widely used and, and, and well-known uh, test framework called PyTest. And that's pre-installed on the Synapse kind of Spark clusters all ready to go. So further down the notebook here, I've got some test logic. And there's a couple of things to note. The first is, it's absolutely possible to create Spark data frames in memory. And that allows us to queue up specific data scenarios, execute the logic we want to execute, and assert that the results was expected. So we can follow a very standard unit test kind of pattern of arrange, act, assert. So the first thing we're testing here is that orders with a duplicated order ID are removed as per our remove duplicate orders uh, function. So we keep a data frame that has two rows of data and they both have the same order ID, even though the other fields inside the data frame are different. If we were to run this cell, we would only get one row back because the second duplicated, or duplicated row has been removed. 
Now, what's interesting about writing tests is that by writing a test for a certain scenario, naturally, it leads you on to what else could happen. So in this case, well, if orders with duplicate order ID removed, what about orders that have a different order ID, but every other field is the same? What do we expect in that case? Well, according to our current logic, we'd expect all three rows to be returned. So we can test that as well. We can also add tests for our aggregations and calculations. In this case, we create four rows of data to add sales by different regions and confirm that they've been aggregated and summed correctly in our total sales calculation. And what's interesting now is in this notebook, we actually have the code for executing our ETL process, and we also have functions that are our tests. So our orchestration cell now needs to deal with both of these cases. So we might want to run all the tests first, and then if they all pass, run our workflow. And if one of the tests was to fail, we wouldn't get this far, the notebook would fall over, and we wouldn't run our ETL processing. So in a way, we've added a very simple quality gate to our end-to-end -end notebook running process. So let's run this notebook now, see what happens. And the notebook has succeeded because our tests have all passed. But if we were to change our logic in our notebook, let's say, for example, let's change how the duplicate order processing has happened, and we actually want to care about distinct rows. We run the notebook again. This time we should run very quickly because the session has already started. Our test will actually fail, meaning our ETL workflow will never actually run. And here we go. Our test is kicked in, and we can see the assertion error is explaining what's gone on. So this is very useful. However, even in this very simple use case, we've only got a couple of kind of uh, fairly simple functions defining some processing in a very, very small kind of ETL process, our notebook is starting to become quite unwieldy. We're mixing and matching ETL processing and test logic and having to orchestrate everything in a cell at the end and rely on the fact that we've done everything in the right order in order for to not run our ETL process by accident if our tests are actually showing that things are wrong. So how do we deal with that? Well, Synapse and other notebook technologies have something called magic commands. And one of these magic commands is a run command that allows you to reference one notebook from another. So we can actually employ fairly standard software engineering practices to start to modulize and pull apart various bits of logic into separate notebooks. So what we might do is create a separate sales data functions notebook that just defines the functions that we care about. Loading the data, removing the duplicate orders, calculating the sales and saving the output. So there's no orchestration in this notebook. It's purely just the business logic of what goes on. Once this is in place, we can then create two separate notebooks, one for our tests that references the functions using the magic run command. This cell basically pulls in all those defined functions into the executing context of this notebook, allowing us to run our tests without any fear of actually running the ETL process. At the same time, we can actually create our ETL uh, notebook. that is exactly the same thing. It references the sales data functions using the magic run command. So all the functions are defined are pulled into memory when we're running this notebook. And then we have our ETL orchestration cell here that actually runs a process for real. What's great now is we've got two entry points into this process. We've got an ETL process and we've got a test process. And we can actually start to add both those things into an end-to-end -end pipeline. And that's exactly what this pipeline is doing. We've got two notebook activities. The first one calls into the sales data test notebook, and the second one calls into the process sales data notebook running the ETL process. But the second notebook activity is only gonna run if the first one succeeds. So our tests are acting as a quality gate for our ETL process to run. Now I know that inside our sales data functions notebook, the logic still remains that we've changed it to drop distinct orders, meaning our tests are gonna fail. So if we were to run this pipeline, we would expect the whole pipeline to fail. And it has failed as expected. And we can even see in the outputs, the error message of why it did fail. So we can go and debug and see what's going on. With that very simple kind of mindset shift, which is to restructure our notebooks such that each logical piece of processing is defined in its own function, it makes it very, very testable. 
once we've done that, we can use the magic run command to actually modularize and split out notebook logic, separating out core functionality from test functionality and from orchestration. And that allows us to line things up in a pipeline as we've seen here to add quality gates to our end-to-end -end process. So in summary, notebooks are code and code should be tested. The key to testing notebooks is to treat each cell as a logical step in an end-to-end -end process, wrapping the code in each cell in a function so it can be tested. The nature of using notebooks for ad hoc and experimental data work means you're probably not going to work test first, so probably most useful in a regression testing scenario or adding quality gates and dealing with edge cases once you've got the core processes up and running. And whilst the demo I've just shown you is used uh, Synapse Notebooks, the concept is absolutely applicable to Databricks or Jupyter Notebooks. And that brings us to the end of this talk. Hopefully I've shown you it's absolutely possible to add quality gates and testing to your data solutions, including tabular models, pipelines, notebooks, long-running ETL processes, and big data sets. And it's entirely possible to do that in a variety of languages and testing frameworks and tools, such as .NET, such as Python, such as TypeScript, JavaScript, Node.js, et cetera, et cetera. I want to end by restating what I said back at the beginning of the talk, which was that fundamentally, the question I want you to ask yourselves is this. For any data solution, any data insight that you're working on, developing or responsible for providing to your stakeholders or customers or organizations, does it matter if it's wrong? Because if it does, you need to be able to prove that it's right. If you want to hear more about what we could help you, then feel free to drop us a line at hello at engine.com. If you still have questions or want to connect, I'm available in the live chat Q&A, or you can find me afterwards in the virtual networking lounge. Thanks for listening.